afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to another episode of EOTT, Everything on the Table, with me, Jimmy James. And uh, really thrilled today, guys, to uh, share my conversation with uh, Carl H. Smith. Carl, how are you, brother? Very well, thank you. Oh, uh, well, thank you for coming along, brother. I know you're an extremely busy chap, so just to give you a bit of background uh, about Carl, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Carl is the uh, director of the Learning Technology Research Institute in London, uh, as well as the Principal Research Fellow at Ravensbourne University in London. So um, I came across Carl's work this year, actually. Uh, I was watching some videos online, and it was the Creative Innovation uh, Conference, the Asia Pacific. Uh, some fascinating stuff you wrote into there, Carl. Um, we'll get mm. to that a little bit later on. And you've just done the Breaking Convention 2019. And again, the whole yeah. double consciousness stuff, which I'm hoping we can chat about that in a little in a little while, tell us a little bit, if you would, Carl, just about your background, if you'd be kind enough. Just, you know, what got you into the path that you've uh, currently found yourself yeah. on? Sure. So I basically um, studied in Glasgow. I studied history of art and philosophy, having gone into, uh, you know, very heavy A-levels. Sort of sort of, I did maths, physics, electronics, computer science, and then uh, discovered cannabis at 17 and got into philosophy, art, history, and sort of switched switched over to the, you know, that sort of humanity side of my brain. And uh, I then, you know, didn't want to do sort of mechanical engineering at uni, so I persisted with the humanities. Um, and I then had to sort of, you know, go into the sciences again. So I, I did a second master's in computer science, and then from there, I uh, got my first job in um, Iran. So reconstructing a palace in the in the middle of the desert in uh, Iran. So Persepolis, I reconstructed the palace of Darius. And that was kind of my first job. So it was a very weird uh, start. Um, but I then spent seven years doing architecture. So I was... Um, yeah, doing 3D modeling around the world, ancient buildings, anything over a thousand years old. And I, yeah, really enjoyed it. And it actually did something to my, my, my consciousness, all that 3D modeling. Um, and I, you know, it was very strange because I was like programming my dreams with these models, these huge architectural models, lots of sacred geometry. Um, and I also, you know, became a better driver because I could sort of see further down the road um, um, because I was modeling these huge structures. So it sort of gave me this sort of peripheral vision, but not in width, but in depth. And I suddenly was able to sort of see further. Um, so I was very interested in the effects of that on my consciousness. And that's kind of like was one of the beginnings of my interests in the relationship between technology and consciousness and memory. And I realized I had made um, memory palaces you familiar with the memory palace idea? Yes, indeed. I read uh, Tony Buzan uh, and some other works in prison of the whole memory palace. And it's on, um, uh, I think it's Hannibal, the movie, he talks about it. And yeah, I've got aphantasia. So I've no visual, uh -huh. yeah, I've no ability to visualize or very, very limited visual ability. So, right. um, although I think it is fair to say it, they talk about it in kind of journeys, right? Or you can have a palace or you can make a journey and a familiar yeah. journey to yourself, whether it's, you know, the journey you make to work every day and each item on your shopping list, leave it at a kind of certain point on the journey, doing something outrageous to kind of, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically, um, um, I was doing a PhD and uh, I, I suddenly realized instead of having it sort of trapped inside this sort of 2D format, I could map um, the PhD into the, these 3D structures because I built them from the ground up. And I, in my mind's eye, even 10, 10, 15 years later now, I can go into the, any part of those structures because I built them and they're sufficiently complex for me to, to remember each detail. And then I can actually map the, the, the content of that PhD into that 3D space and have that content communicate with itself in ways that it wouldn't do if it was stuck in the tomb of the, the 2D, the flat 2D. So, and is that, that something, Carla, sorry to just interject quickly, is that something that you just developed your own kind of, you had the foundations of what the memory palace kind of concept is, and then you've just kind of gone with, run with it and you yeah. your own kind of... Um, That's right, I started to think about what can I, you know, it's always nice if you can get more than one use out of whatever you do. Mm. Uh, I'm always interested in, you know, multiple, um, you know, form factors for that 
that content you know that, that that's you know the whole context thing is so so important to me so i um yeah i started really utilizing my own human abilities my uh, you know pushing memory in a way that i hadn't done before um and i you know i was very interested in super one of the core interests of mine is memory and amnesia and and what can we do with our memories um which i mean one of my big pro projects is writing a diary for the last 30 years and um, I've written it from sort of three levels. So content, what I did, context, what I felt, and concepts, what I thought. So I've basically got you know, doing, um, thinking, and feeling. Nice. All captured. So five minutes a day for the last yeah. 30 years. I've got the whole thing written down. And actually, I'm turning my life into architecture because I don't look at it. I don't read it. I take cross sections through it. So I look at this year, last year and the year before 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 for 30 years. And I get all of these different, these 30 different me's communicating again. And um, I find that really fascinating because that's using my memory in a way that I couldn't do naturally. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting idea because it allows me, you know, say if I've been, a, been in a relationship for a year, I can read that year in an afternoon. Yeah. And then I can turn that relationship into a, a, a map. You know, I can see it as a bird's eye view. I can look over it and see patterns emerge. And, uh, you know, it's kind of therapy, you know, to be able to see what you've done and try and avoid repeating it. Yeah, um, nice. it's, all, it's all about hacking, hacking the moment. And everyone goes on about, you know, what the fact is you know, the moment's the most important thing, being in the moment, which is true. But I'm also very interested in having that field of view you know, jumping out of point of view, going into the overview effect and actually seeing what I'm, you know, what I'm creating over time. Um, because I think that it's very important to, to monitor your, you know, your productivity or your moods, your like, you know, the way you interact with other people and sort of, you know, self, self-reflection through, um, through different technologies and tools and methodologies. Beautiful. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think um, I've read a lot of Tim Ferriss and he's kind of done a similar thing where he's just got notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks. You know, he talks mm -hmm. about um, he sees an old photo of himself where he's looking pretty fantastic. He says, oh, what was that? What, what, what date was that? What was I doing? Gets his notebook out. Oh, I was doing that workout. And boom, he can just recreate any kind of mm -hmm. period in his life. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Kind of. So is that more um, using kind of notebooks, rudimentary kind of uh, technology, pen and paper, and that kind of stuff. How are you? First, then? first ten years was um, was analog, so a year per year, and then the last twenty years have been d digital. So just one massive word document. Um, I trust you've triple backed up, yeah, triple redundant. Well, yeah, I mean it's more it's more the fact that I can't, you know, you, you can't actually open that size of word document really, and, and um, so I have to break it into into bits, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look at what's the next stage for it. And I think um, one of the ideas is to use natural language processing to feed it into an AI. Right. That, because I've written it from those three levels, I could actually do some very interesting stuff in, a, in an AI engine um, and potentially get to a position where the um, I could ask the AI version of myself questions that I can't answer. Right. So it would be running off a very clean data set, which is just the summaries of what I've done, rather than all the noise that I've got. Yes, I see. So you know, it's a it's a, it's a working um, process of trying to explore different ways of doing that because it's a, it's already digital. So I probably won't work with the analog stuff, but if I can get the digital stuff um, fed into that AI, then then start to look at how how it can be done. I mean, I've got a brilliant friend Christian who's part of Be Another Lab who's um he's using the uh the deep fake for texts algorithm we've been talking about this stuff yeah yeah so that that is really interesting so he's he's harvesting his um his social media data with his girlfriend so just his facebook's messenger data he's fed all that into this ai and uh, the ai started having conversations between him and his girlfriend right so yeah the signature of that relationship is actually quite easily you know available to, to 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 be identified by the ai and then eerily you can see these conversations that they've never had being produced and and it freaks them both out because you know they're they're they're, 
their consciousness is being hacked and, and duplicated and replicated and uh, what you know. Yes, this is the, um, the, the prospects here, the implications rather. I saw something the other day which was talking about the fact that um, the reason, maybe not the reason, but the, the, uh, the side consequence of emojis and how we're all kind of just using emojis now to communicate, but what's also happened then is you've got kind of maybe bots or um, AI kind of, you know, I'm not too, it's some stuff that I'm discovering, you know, there's so much information out there, it's hard to know what's what, but it was just saying about the fact that because we're all using emojis, it's kind of a little bit of a degradation of communication, but also then um, with regards to AI being kind of, used in certain platforms where you, you don't actually realize you're engaging with an AI, but if, mm -hmm. um, but you know when it's kind of an automated message, but when it's emojis, you, you don't really know the difference. So mm. there seems to be, um, yeah, there's so many different kinds of um, facets of what's going on. And what I really liked about uh, when I was listening to your Carl, was you had two things to say. And the one was that, you know, we're seeing the zombification, you know, of the world with s smart tech and, and smartphones and stuff and you know technology is not going to save us you have to save ourselves so i really yeah. like the fact that you are kind of pushing the more organic route which i think is where we need to be going would you be um kind enough to tell us a little bit about the the double consciousness experiment you're doing with part of ars it's been was it five years you said in the preparation of that team of you guys yeah so i'm i mean I've just come back from Melbourne where I, where you mentioned that talk where I, I it was a back to back keynote with uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's, you know, famously one of the first transhumanist singularity university, et cetera, director yeah. of engineering at Google. Um, and he's, you know, for me, the, the transhumanist project is problematic because it amplifies what was laid down with humanism, which is that we are the, most important species. We are the ones that should be exploiting everything else. And I think that's really backfired. As we can see, we've destroyed all of, you know, 60% of everything that exists, every other species um, in 40, 40 years, you know, it's, it's madness. So I think that we need to reframe the human um, and we need to get a grip on the fact that actually we are, we're more, more of a virus than a, um, a benefit to the planet as we currently are operating yeah uh, and i th you know i'm very much aware that um these things can be done i mean you know if you look at post-humanism as opposed to transhumanism or, or hyperhumanism as i'm as i'm framing it is this idea that we um we don't actually we don't want to be um considering ourselves as, as top of the food chain this arrogance is part of the problem so how can we how can we understand that the the human condition is an open notion that it is open to change that we're not stuck in this uh, operating system that we currently um, are operating within um, and how do we get that message out there as quickly as we can and I and I'm really in, I'm sort of collecting all these examples of um, where people are exploring other umwelts so if we look at for instance you know, the mushroom, the mycelium networks, which you could argue have a bigger consciousness range or they have a bigger network than, than, than we do, than humans do. So it would seem, yeah. Super interesting about that is that the, the mushrooms lasted five mass extinctions um, and, and yet we're causing the sixth. So what can we learn from the mushroom and the way the mushroom operates um, and see if that can be applied in, a, in, in our, in our, you know, in our, in our realms so you know there's there's various mad examples where you know there's people that don't think we're going to evolve into becoming robots they, they think we're going to evolve animals so we obviously are animals anyway and that's a part of the arrogance um, but there's this one artist who sort of I saw. Go <laughs> I saw that yeah and I will put the link in the description box to both videos it's, it's quite amazing yeah. you know uh, yeah, yeah. I think the double consciousness stuff um, relates to that, but it's more that, you know, the, the shaman, the typical shaman is, is in two locations at the same time. So they're typically the, the, the doctors that are taking the antigen to go through your system and actually look at where you're needing to be, you know, fixed either with sound or with, you know, other, other methods. So they're taking the medicine to cure you. 
um, but they're you know they're going through the, the astral whilst very firmly fixed um, in the, in the physical. And I and I and and it was actually Roy Ascot that talked about you know the cyber realms being very very akin to that. So that we've got you know people in VR headsets very much somewhere else. You can see from the way they move their bodies, they forget that they have a physical presence in this realm, but they definitely are in this realm, and that's why it's useful for PTSD. So you know, looking at um, all sorts of different things, even childbirth was one of them. I saw the childbirth one especially. Yeah, I'd never seen that before. That was kind of a bit of an eye opener. And there's there's lots of um, work going into burns patients that mm. you know, that basically are now having, you know, they're combining a sort of, sort of disassociative like ketamine with um, VR, and then they're having their 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 burns um, dressings replaced yeah. whilst they're going through this disassociation. And I think VR has the power to take you away from from your pain because you know we all know that one pain can be taken away from another you know and, and we can we can sort of trick trick the human system so i'm yeah. really interested in in what we the application areas of, of this double consciousness and 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 in my talk at um breaking invention um there's a brilliant bit of footage that jules evans uh, pointed me towards which was um, um huxley talking about um this idea that we need to take holidays from ourselves and that we need to switch off the default mode network or certainly turn the volume down on it and actually have this ability to, to have a holiday away from ourselves or at least away from this, criti this critic mm -hmm. that's constantly nagging us. You're rubbish. You're not yeah. doing well. You're doing really, you know, you're, you're terrible. And that is, I think, is a common thing amongst all of us that we that we never feel like we do enough we never feel like we're productive enough we never feel successful enough and that's the power of these medicines to actually turn that volume down a little while just to give you a holiday from yourself and uh, and to be you know here and somewhere else at the same time which is according to Huxley the entire purpose of life itself so it strikes me that this idea of looking towards double consciousness as a as an operating system as a way to go and lots of different you know ways of doing it as well as on application areas once you're there so yeah that's that's double consciousness and it, and it also relates to this idea of holotech so this is the way to do it so for instance you know holo, holo means to combine into the whole in in greek and tech means technique so combining different techniques into a stack um, so imagine a different, like, I'll give you an example. So, you know, we, a lot of us do a meditation before going into a VR application. Now, that's certainly something I'm working with on the Cyberdelic Society side of things with Jose. Um, so we would, you know, we, we're very careful of the, to, much like when you're taking a, um, an entheogen, a psychedelic, um, you have preparation work. So you may do some, some meditation, you may do some breath work. You may then take a, uh, a psychedelic. You may then choose to go into a VR experience. You may then choose to sing, to dance, to do any sort of you know traditional body work, um, and then you know come out of come out. And, and it's this idea of stacking these interventions into a recipe, a protocol that you can then share and see if it works for other people. Because one of the most complicated things about this idea of holotech is that the individual differences are also something that you're going to have to put into the matrix. You know, so we, we, you know, we don't know gender differences, age differences. So it's like a whole new science is being revealed. Um, and Roy Ascot started it with this idea of moist media, which is combining the dryware with the wetware um, and dryware being your, you know, your technology, wetware being your biology. So, you know, there's loads of experiments going on, like um, on Reddit, for instance, there's a group called Rift Into the Mind. Um, which is Making all that, Rift Into yeah, the Mind. Yeah, people, people using mostly VR, but then taking different substances and going into different VR experiences and then reporting back what they find. So it's like this crowdsourcing, citizen science approach. Um, and nobody's advocating anything, but obviously for me... This is it, yeah, it's wonderful. It's kind of open source as you... And I think it's, you know, it's your birthright to be able to change your consciousness as you wish, as long as you're not harming anyone else, yeah. not harming society, not buying substances that have got a whole chain of events that are toxic, you know, yeah. being, very, being very scientific about what you're doing 
and you know sharing what you're learning with others because I think you can't do anything as an individual anymore it's all about working in in groups and in teams and I think that's absolutely a wonderful message to, to spread that we need to to ramp up our experimentation we need to do the empirical stuff you know go out there do the work take responsibility for yourself and also don't expect technology to save you it's not about just taking drugs or just taking different te technologies it's about the integration with the body with the mind with your your body as a technology and i think all the traditional things all the traditional methods are completely valid and they can be combined into this stacking and yeah. I think that for me is the you know it's, it's you can see it's going to take many many years to have these experiments done and, and i think that we need to to do these experiments beautiful beautiful thank you carl yes um Dirk and Engelbert were kind enough to come and have a chat and we were talking about it in terms of kind of mapping the terrain, you know, and mm. this is what we're essentially doing all this open source experimentation and as you say with the um, individual differences, it's difficult to know what's going to it, but it's only by exploring and sharing results that we're able to see then, oh yeah, we've yeah. got consistency here and all this kind of stuff. Um, you mentioned the astral, which brings me, I've got a little note I wanted to ask you about the Persinger helmet, which mm. stimulates uh, lucid dreaming states. And I've seen a few different different texts, the, the goggles or the lights and different bits and bobs. And I was just wondering, obviously the Persinger helmet looks very, um, very rudimentary. Do you think that um, there is a far more miniaturized, effective, Bit of kit out there now, perhaps not for public yeah. consumption, of course. Yeah, but, you know. per Person's helmet was, uh, you know, very, you know, much like a you know, motorcycle helmet. It's not something you would want to be wearing as, on a general basis. But that has been, uh, I can send you a link to the more modern, modern version of it. Um, and what it's actually doing is, rather than, um, yeah, lucid dreams is a sort of modern um, uh, take on it, but or a lot of modern application area that wasn't thought about at the time. But when you uh, created, he wanted to create out of body in the room, and so another okay. presence behind you or something. And depending on whether you're stimulating the right or the left angular gyrus in the brain, um, you would either reliably have an out of body experience or have this sense of presence. So, you know, it, Olaf Blanca did a lot of re, um, these experiments and, um, you know, from a very materialist perspective saying, well, if we can show that, you know, we can simulate an out-of-body out experience, then the out-of-body experience is just brain activity and there's nothing more to it. But as I would agree with David Luke that, you know, much like a VR experience can create uh, or can create the, this sort of, fake out of body experience so with an oculus you can actually not look into a game environment but look into two cameras and the cameras are sort of 10 20 foot behind you and you're looking you're looking into this vr going who's that and it's you so immediately you're out of body and looking at yourself going oh my god like so it's you know so it's super easy to trick the brain with these sort of fake um out of body experiences but they're not the real thing and I think what's interesting about them is that they may then create a neural network that you may then have a real experience so it's again using the technology to create the the context to create the foundations for you to have the real experience whatever the real experience is but I mm. think that's, that's the point it's always about this idea of stabilizers on the bike you know you use the stabilizers until you learn how to do the actual actual task and then remove them don't become dependent on technology. Don't become a transhumanist. We're already zombified enough as it is. Let's get rid of screens, but let's also like think about all the ways that the technology can be used for good before the military start using it for evil. And they're going to use it for evil. So it's a kind of a it's a it's it's a war between you know the, the good and evil, and it's you know, yeah. it's, it's a battle yeah. to fight every day. You're not wrong there, Carl. You're not wrong. You know, we've seen all these nefarious applications and whatnot. But as you say, there's, there's far more of us than there is of them. And there's so many positive applications. And I like what I want to get onto is I'm looking to set up a flotation center, sensory deprivation tanks, where I'd also yeah. like to then stack the uh, brain entrainment lights and mm -hmm. obviously the other things as well. And what I liked 
the field space um, application, which, um, forgive me, I can't remember the specific details, but it's to do with you can use this piece of technology to adopt a new skill, but then, yeah. as you say, in the, in the analogy of the stabilizers, then take it away. Yeah. Um, by all means, uh, sorry, just quickly, by all means, I'm fascinated by technology and the thought of being able to kind of, you know, try a bit of a contact lens um, computer system to, you know, have subroutines running and kind of accentuate my, you know, ability to function. But also at the end of the day, I want to be able to take it off, you know, and I want to be able to yeah. go into a flotation tank in a Faraday cage and just be a fully organic human being. And I always want to retain that. Um, birthright for the remainder of my time here and what I'm like I did mention to you briefly but this whole thing of kind of mandating vaccines are we going to get to a point with the do you know you have the the tech that can test your sweat for glucose levels and things like that are we going to see baby steps baby steps where you know they're going to try and start mandating technology because that's then for me the start of the decline you know i know we're already kind of at a bit of a decline not to be a negatron or anything like that but what mm. do you think about all that carl is that kind of do you see that I, I personally think that that's kind of where they will try and take it but you know i'm not sure yeah well i think the you know what you're saying about having your sovereignty over your analog body is very important and and we, we're in a very important time in history because we are the last generation will, which will be bridging the analog with the digital so unless we successfully bring the best of the analog into the new mixed reality, the new digital, then, you know, we will be zombified for good because there'll be no, there'll be no memory of that time when we had that sovereignty over our bodies and that we weren't plugged into the matrix or chipped or like, you know, neuro lace from Elon Musk. Um, and I think that the positive things and why I've been so interested in mixed reality for the last 20 years is that it allows us an opportunity to return to the body not sitting like we are now in behind desks because we don't, we won't need to be staring at a laptop. We will have computing, you know, inside our vision. We will basically be back in the world. We will be, you know, able to interact with the natural world and get to know the natural world. If you think about pack Pokemon go 147 million downloads, but that was just to, to go and chase these monsters around these fake monsters. But what about using the same technology to go and get people to vote or to go and get people to un understand where they should be buying their products? Because most of your power as a, as a consumer is in where you purchase your goods, whether it's your banking, your electricity, your, you know, whether you're a vegan or a vegetarian and you're trying to avoid, you know, these sorts, you know, because there's, there's problems with veganism as well as with, with the meat kind of environment. You're starting to see all this, man, yeah, it's all coming out. Yeah. So, so having the information where you need it without having to get on your phone and this constant distraction, you know, you, this ability to, for your glasses or your contact lenses to see what you're looking at and actually give you that information automatically without this constant, you know, the distraction, the attention economy is the big enemy at the moment um, alongside apathy. So if we, can, if we can solve the attention problem and the apathy problem, by making people realize you have power, you have power as an individual. And most of that power comes into where you're spending your money because your real job is, you know, as Adam Curtis says, is in the supermarkets, is in the shopping malls. And it, most of well, the rest of what you're doing is just, you know, emulation. So, I mean, I really like your point about, um, you know, the Faraday cage idea, because I imagine, you know, especially with 5G coming in that a lot of the parties will just, be in a you know massive Faraday cage and you will be going to places where you know you're not going to get these these EMFs and yeah. taking the technology off and what I'm really enthused about is you know the the, the desert people deserting Facebook you know I use it I subvert it I try and use it use it for good and to create movements and not use, yeah. use it for personal, you know not posting not trying to be this sort of perfect version or this fake version where you're just trying to you know, that's such a total waste of time and creating an avatar yeah. where you can never keep up. Mm. It's a bit like internet dating where somebody puts fake photos of what they look like 10 years before. <laughs> it's like uh, one, one yeah. go well. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. So I think the mixed reality stuff's interesting. Um, one of the downsides of it is that we will never be able to forget anything anymore because if you think about what this means is that you'll be taking photographs every single second. Yeah. Before. And I'm really interested in, in amnesia and memory. And see, my working theory is that 
you know, if you're a designer god and you're omnipotent, you have complete, you know, power, what are you going to do with it? And I think what you're going to do with it is you're going to inject amnesia into the system because being one, being a unity is by definition lonely. Yeah. So you inject amnesia into the system and you're going to do all of this. And the core of all of this is amnesia. Yeah. We're all God and we've forgotten. And I think the forgetting of forgetting is a crucial thing that we, we, we will create technologies which will mean we won't be able to forget. And that's called an amnesia. Um, and I, I think that's a really interesting thing that technology can give us. The most, the most problematic part of that is that the only reason we get on is that we forget the annoying things that we do to each other and the bitchy fights that we have. And there's that mad Black Mirror episode where there's a couple of fighting. They're going, yeah, you said this, you said that, and you said this, and I said, no, I didn't. And they're like, well, look then. So they just put it on the telly and then everything's there. So you can't, you know, so I think forget or but at, at a bigger level, um, you know, realizing, you know, rewinding back to, um, you know, the author through this amnesia, realizing what we are is ultimately what, what it's all about. Yeah, thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's um, the amnesia is the big issue, and that's all part of the game. That's what seems to be coming up time and time again. But um, chatting with uh, Dirk and Engelbert uh, the other night, and talking about it in the context of you know the holographic universe principle, uh, the, the whole is contained within every atom. So therefore, the need to be going out externally, nuts and bolts, crafts, exploring planets. Not sure what's really going on there. We won't get into all that, but the fact of the matter is, it seems that we can go into ourselves. And I say, through the sensory deprivation, the flotation, um, using the light technology to facilitate it as well. Because I'm not, I won't push you on it, but like, for example, you may or may not know a psychedelic experience. Uh, once you're in for the ride, you're in for the ride. You know, there's no, oh, I'm not like this, I want to get off. It's like you're committed now. But with, the, with these kind of different technologies, I feel like it's really important that people can use them to be able to explore into themselves and potentially have just as powerful an experience as you would do on psychedelics. Just mm. sort of like a brain entrainment like, can you, I know you guys are personal friends. Can you t t t tell us um, any kind of personal experiences you've had with the light, notable ones? Yeah, I mean, I'm really very excited to hear about the new developments with the light um, and the fact that you now have a controller, so you control the frequencies and you control the patterns. Engelbert was very happy about this, yeah. Yeah, and what was really exciting was that they, you know, even them themselves didn't know how they would react to, to you know, they thought it would be quite a clunky thing, but then they sort of go into this completely intuitive playing with the light and then they're suddenly like, it's like the body is more intelligent than you are. So, you know, respecting that and actually, you, you know, going into this trance-like state and letting the body do what it wants, I think is a really profound thing that they've created. And, and again, Lucia for me is a massive, important uh, cyberdelic. It's one of the first cyberdelics where we can reliably say people are having not psychedelic, not traditional psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. They're having, you know, of the same magnitude. And I think we're not trying to, get rid of psychedelics like you say a lot of people will never take them because they're illegal because they can't control them um, but with these things and I know Anthony Pig is a dear friend of mine as well he had a crazy out-of-body experience with this where he just he said oh, that's it I'm getting out of this room you know so I think that's it's it's this double consciousness idea where you you stay in the room but you let you you let your mind go or you let your you know you let yourself go into a trance but you still have the option of just taking the technology off and I think that's something that a lot of people will then, it'll become more democratic. It will democratize. Mm, this is my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, people will be able to, to get involved. And I think, like I say, changing your consciousness, like the, like the way you change the channels on television is for me what it's all about because, you know, people are watching television. Yeah. You know, wasting their precious lives. You live for a thousand months. Yeah, and, and there's so many much more profound things you can be doing with yourself. And for me, that's why it's all about this idea of changing. And the new economy is not going to be about watching content, consuming information. It's going to be about changing the way you perceive the world as the content. And for me, that's about the context. So it's about a context economy where we can see there's a thirst for having experience, the immersive, you know, 
immersive theatres springing up everywhere. People don't want to just sit there and watch a film. They want to be in the film. Mm-hmm. They, want to, they want to be inside the computer game. And I think that's the, that's the new world that we're going we're gonna to see. And, and you can see it with people meditating. You can see it with people doing breath work. They're changing the way they perceive. And then all that content changes because you, you've changed the, you know, the way that you're seeing that content. So that's, that's a big, big part of what I'm, what I'm all about is this idea of context engineering. Yes, thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. And yeah, that's what kind of intrigued me by watching your, you know, watching your videos and listening to what you had to say. Because, uh, as I say about the flotation stuff, you know, there are some people who are kind of a little bit puritanical about it. Shall we say it's it's all about the sensory deprivation. But I'm thinking, well, no, you can bring other things in. You can bring in the light technology, which will, you know, accentuate the experience, or perhaps binaural beats, or any of these different things. And I think it's only by exploring, as you say, more importantly, the stacking. Mm. As you say, it's the the change in the context of the experience, which I think is really nice. I uh, I really yeah. appreciate that. Just to just a point on that. So yeah, you know, going back to that point about the sensory deprivation. I mean, I can see both sides of it. I can see how a lot of people want to keep it pure. You mm. know, not not you know, go go deep into the you know the the non-sensing. Um, but then you know, it's it's it's. Yeah, what is beyond the senses, and that is a, that's a huge question and a hugely interesting. But going back to the breaking convention showcase, so we did a cyberdelic showcase there, and um, basically Rachel Linton brought her her Simatics Gong, which is a very analog piece. So it's imagine a, a, a gong on its you know flat on its horizontal, filled yeah. with a small golden liquid. And then she's hitting it from underneath, and she's you can see these cymatic patterns. Mm-hmm directly because of the way she set it up. Uh, Engelbert and Dirk, who were in the, the room next door, came in and had a look at it and thought, oh, that light on top of this, uh, the light that was illuminating these cymatics patterns, they were going, oh, that doesn't look like a very good light. Should we put our Lucia light on top of it? So they basically put the Lucia light on top. And then there's a film, I haven't, didn't see this at the time, but I was super excited to hear it. So they created this stacking intuitively where they're combining these two cyberdelic experiences and then they're creating something wild. Like they, they filmed the, the, the cymatics that were coming out with the, with the strobing light. And it was just mind blowing. It's almost like they've created an entirely new space that has not been thought of before. And for me, yeah, that's yeah. what it's all about. You know, let's, let's not think that we've, as John Lennon said in 1980, music's all been done. You know, there's, there's every combination, yeah. every, I mean, how naive. Very, very uh, naive, very naive and arrogant, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is it. It's only by kind of open source and everything just open source, you know, this whole stuff about patenting and technology. I do understand, obviously, the current paradigm you've got, you know, research and development. People need to recoup their investments and all the rest of it. But with a change of uh, kind of perspective in society, getting more towards what people have mentioned, this service-based kind of society and stuff. But yeah, it can just all be put out there. And if everyone's benefiting from it, it'll mm-hmm. just grow and develop. And, you know, it's all the young minds as well. They look at it and go, Oh, have you, or like like the like the guys did with the kind of the gong and the you just look at it and think oh have you tried this have you thought of this and then mm. the possibilities are limitless Carl they are mate and I think that that's the point about ownership as well that when when we move away from this content based obsession you know keeping up with the Joneses when you realise that you know like when in the sixties when the, you know psychedelics came on mass and they were like well people will stop buying stuff. I mean, that can now be done without even needing to take psychedelics, but because we're, like you say, a service-based society where you don't own a car, you hire one when you need it. You don't yeah. own, a, you know, you don't own stuff. You just get it while you need it. And I think that that is very, very much about this, this context-based stuff that you, you don't get bogged down with, with possessions because those possessions end up, you don't own the possessions, they own you. Yeah. And, it, uh, you know, and then, then you're just, you're just, you know, you can't take it with you yeah. and you end up with all this stuff that you have to carry around with you or put it into storage. And, you know, you live for a thousand months, so you don't own anything. You don't even own your own body. And people are obsessed with getting the bigger house, the bigger car, whatever. It's complete, you know, it's, it's the opposite of where we need to be going as, as a culture. And, you know, I think people are really waking up to it. 
Fair play. Yeah, no, I agree. And it is. People want change. You know, just the way things are at the moment, it's not working for anybody. You know, the whole Ubuntu principle is not good for everyone. It's not good for anyone. Yeah. Well, I did want to ask you, Carl. I've been uh, doing a bit of research this week and I found the article talking about the fact that Google have reached quantum supremacy with their computing mm. power. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to even try and pretend I understand how quantum computers work. But what I did want to ask you was from your perspective. Um, if we talk of it analogy, uh, uh, in terms of analogy, like comparing um, a Game Boy then to you know your Oculus Rift. Mm. Um, so if you were to show you know the chief engineer on the Game Boy program uh, a few decades ago and show him like one of these quantum computers, um, the potential implications of what they can be used for. What, what, do you think there's potential for these things to be used for creative false realities like? Um, or allowing consciousness to access altered dimensions, so essentially like altered carbon, like um, mm. holodecks, essentially. Is that what this mm. technology could be potentially used for? Because they talk about things like cryptocurrency and all these other applications. I'm not really sure what they're using it for, to be honest, but is that something that we could see in time? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I, 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 was, in, um, I was invited over to the European Economic Congress um, to talk on a panel with like seven AI experts and they're just like all business as usual. Let's use it to make more money. And I'm like, Jesus, let's get the AI, which isn't really AI. It's machine learning. And let's get that straight. Um, you know, it, basically AI is an autistic savant. Um, right. Very, very good at very specific tasks, but not good yeah. with, with general intelligence at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's something that you need to remember. And I think, that, you know, if we can get the AIs, I mean, look at cryptocurrency, look at Bitcoin, it's an absolute terrible waste of resources, terrible waste of energy. But if that, if that computing process, if that processing could be trained to, to look at real world problems, to look yeah. at cats, to, then let's do that. Don't, don't just let it just number crunch, you know, it's completely retarded. And I think, you know, I won't invest until I know that this stuff is being used, either that, that it's recycled energy that's that's you know powering it yeah. or that it's, it's being used for real world problems so i'm thinking you know ai is not really my field but i'm like let's let's get on to you know getting it looking at, at climate change getting it, not trying to make more money because it's just yeah. you can't eat money well this is it buckminster fuller i i hope it's uh, accredited to him because i've seen it a few times but turning all the weaponry to livingry you know Mm. All that money and resources. What was, the, what was the phrase? Weaponry to? Uh, uh, if we turned all the weaponry to livingry, the, we could have a utopia tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it is a bit idealistic, but you know, the potentials are there and it is all there. Well, Carl, I really appreciate you coming to chat with me, brother. Was there anything you wanted to round off to before we uh, wrap up? God, mate. Well, well, I think we should have a part two because 100%, I think this, 100%, this is yeah. perfect for, for a nice uh, getting, to, getting to sort of test the waters. But yeah, this is part, it. Let's have part two another night. And uh, yeah, pleasure. pleasure to chat. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. Like I said, I'll put the links in the description box uh, if anyone wants to check out your other stuff. But yeah, that'll be wonderful. I'd like to ask all my guests if we get an ongoing narrative and just keep our ears to the ground and see what's going on on the ground level. Wicked. Nice one, mate. Oh, well, thank you for your time, brother. All the best. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.